Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our new conference today. My name is Ali Safavi, and I'm a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the National Council of Resistance of Iran, NCI, which seeks the establishment of a democratic, secular, non-nuclear republic in place of the current uh, ruling theocracy. Welcome to this important news conference, the IRGC papers exposing IRGC's elaborate international scheme to evade sanctions and finance terror. This conference is quite timely because of growing international concern over the regime's nuclear weapons program, its military assistance in Ukraine conflict, and its continued mischief in the Middle East and its hindrance of maritime shipping in the Persian Gulf. This highly sensitive and classified information, which includes letters exchanged among regime's top brass, such as the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, shed light on the extent to which the ruling theocracy is willing to go to circumvent sanctions to secure the necessary funds that will enable it to finance its terrorism, warmongering, and destabilizing activities in the Middle East Beyond and beyond, as well as empowering its security forces to crack down on protesters and uprisings that have shaken the regime to its core. Before I give the floor to my esteemed colleague, uh, Ali Reza Jafar Zadeh, who is the Deputy Director of the NCRI's Washington office, a couple of housekeeping matters. First of all, I'd be grateful if you turn off or mute your uh, cell phones. The news conference today will be live streamed on NCRI US. YouTube channel, uh, NCRI Twitter, at NCRI US. And there will be a question and answer period after Ali Reza finishes his presentation. Uh, priority is given to the accredited media. Those watching online can send their questions to media at ncri.org. That is media at ncri.org. And now, without further ado, I ask Ali Reza to take the podium. Thank you so much, uh, <clears throat> Ali, and um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, coming to uh, office at the uh, National Council of Resistance of Iran, U.S. Representative Office. Um, I would like to uh, present to you today the most detailed, well-documented information about the a very elaborate scheme by the Iran regime to basically fund terror um, by circumventing sanctions and um, uh, providing funds and um, those terror operations, but also suppression inside the country. And I'm going to use the PowerPoint presentation to present to you the um, evidence and the information today. Uh, without further ado, let's uh, start um, with the um, with a source. Where does the information come from? It's actually uh, coming, as before, um, from the network inside Iran of an Iranian opposition uh, organization, uh, the People's Mujahideen Organization of Iran, or the MEK, which is the uh, pivotal member organization within the National Council of uh, Resistance of Iran. It also comes uh, from the network of the MEK inside the various um, agencies or organs of the Iran regime, uh, particularly the armed forces, uh, where the bulk of this information is actually uh, focused on that. Um, so uh, we've called this the um, IRGC papers, or a set of uh, uh, documents and information that we have obtained from inside the Iran regime that basically um, um, show evidence of what we have earlier um, today. Uh, the Iran regime has been circumventing sanctions and funding terror and repression inside the country. So uh, the main focus today will be on Petrochemical Commercial Company International, um, 
uh, we'll be referring to it as PCCI, uh, which is the entity that actually bypasses the oil and petrochemical sanctions in astronomical dimensions. Uh, we're talking about, you know, very large numbers and then spending the um, resulting financial benefits to uh, promote the regime's terrorism abroad and uh, suppression inside the country. Uh, but let's, in order to better understand what we're talking about, let's take a look at the, um, the structure of the regime, where this uh, entity actually uh, stands within the uh, structure of the Iran regime. Uh, the regime created a mechanism um, to what they call the resistance economy, which is the code name for circumventing sanctions. And um, the entire task for that is actually uh, given and allocated to the armed forces uh, of the regime. And all of the resources, the economy is actually uh, practically have come under the control of the armed forces. Uh, you can see here the supreme leader, and then you have the armed forces chief of staff, um, RGC Major General Mohammad Baghiri. He is, uh, he is a, a very veteran member of the IRGC over the years. He's the one who oversees all of these such activities. And they have created something called the Headquarters for Resistance Economy, uh, headed by another IRGC uh, uh, commander, Asghar Saleh Sohani, is an IRGC um, uh, admiral uh, whose job of this um, headquarters is to basically control the economy, uh, bring it under the control of the, uh, the military, the armed forces, and then circumvent sanctions. Let's look at the next layer under uh, the, the headquarters. Uh, you can see all of the, uh, you know, you have the state security forces headed by Beijing, Mohammad um, Rizal He's an IRGC person. And, and you have the IRGC itself, the, headed by the major uh, Hossein Salami is the uh, commander, and then you have the army chief, and then you have the minister of defense uh, that uh, basically does all the coordinations, uh, headed by uh, now by Mohammad Zashtiani. Let's go one layer further, and uh, here's the top organization that has been overseeing all of such activities, um, uh, it's called Armed Forces Social Security Organization. Uh, the abbreviation is actually SATA, uh, <clears throat> headed by RGC Brigadier General Majid Ibn Reza. And it is this organization, SATA, um, that um, oversees all of the financial uh, activities, um, the resources, the procurement, and the allocation of the resources to the military, it goes to them. <clears throat> and then you have a number of uh, major organizations that go under. Our interest is focused on this one. That's Khadir Investment Company, headed by um, Maziar Hosseini. He's a, a close uh, protege of Mohammed Baghir Qalibaf, who veteran member, uh, commander of the Revolutionary Guards, who is now the head of this, the, uh, the party. <clears throat> and then this Qadir Investment Company is, is a huge financial uh, institution. It has over 140 uh, companies. It has uh, at least eight major holdings. One of those holdings is right here. And uh, uh, we're talking about billions of dollars of interactions, it, it owns uh, all in the oil and petrochemical industry. They have at least 29 um, uh, petro oil and petrochemical refineries all over the uh, country. Now, <clears throat> one of those holdings is actually Arsian Oil and Gas Development Group, uh, headed by the IRGC Brigadier General Ahmed Wahid You may know about him. He has been all over. For the past 30, 40 years, a veteran of the Iran-Iraq War, um, anything, um, anywhere that were money and resources and, and his relationship with the IRGC, Ahmad Wahid Dastyardi has been there. And um, he has um, been appointed as the head, within the past two years, as the head of the board of directors <coughs> of 
the uh, Parsian Oil and Gas Development Group. And then here is Petrochemical Commercial Company International, PCCI. In other words, PCCI is actually the front organization, is the, the entity that, that does all of those transactions uh, in order to provide a fund uh, for these organizations going all the way to, uh, to, uh, to SATA. Uh, we have a lot of things to talk about, all of the, uh, you know, these issues, but today's press conference is actually focused <clears throat> on this uh, particular entity, the PCCI. Uh, uh, let's get into, uh, get a better picture. I'm, I went back to the big chart so you can see, like, where PCCI stands, and that's Parsian, that's Qadir, and the, uh, that's SATA, and the Ministry of Defense, and the Headquarters for Resistance Economy, and then you have the um, uh, chairman of uh, uh, chief of staff of armed forces, Gheri, and then, of course, the supreme leader controls uh, everything at the end of the day. Now, uh, we're going to go to the uh, documents, um, uh, some of the um, documents to actually show the evidence of what we're actually discussing today. Um, <clears throat> the PCCI was actually established in 2000 in um, Jersey. It's one of the uh, small um, islands in the Channel Island um, in the UK. It's a free trade zone. Um, but in May 2011, the US actually designated, the, the State Department designated PCCI um, under the um, um, Iran Sanctions Act. Um, that's a secondary sanctions. And then uh, shortly after, in August 2011, uh, the PCCI actually moved from the uh, uh, Channel Island uh, to Labuan Island uh, in Malaysia. That's actually one is a free trade um, uh, island, as I said, um, similar to the previous one. Just to give you an idea, uh, that's the, in Jersey, the small island right here. In UK, moving it, um, uh, registering it now in Labuan, Malaysia, because this will give them a totally different cover. Uh, this will give them the ability to further evade sanctions um, and move away attention to whatever they were doing uh, before. <coughs> the PCCI currently has four trust companies. Uh, it has offices in um, uh, Jebel, uh, Jebel Ali Free Zone. Um, it has uh, one trust company in Turkey. Uh, it also is the largest um, entity uh, with a history of uh, presence activity in Turkmenistan, and everyone knows Turkmenistan. They have one of the largest gas reserves in the world. If you're doing anything in petrochemical world, Turkmenistan is right there. And uh, so that's not by accident that the PCCI ha actually has an office uh, right there. So let's uh, get into the details activities of the PCCI, um, they are um, in charge of selling the crude oil quota that is allocated to the armed force, and I will elaborate uh, a little further on that one based on the documents that we have obtained. And the documents actually the extent of the dimension of the crude oil uh, that is allocated to the armed forces. Uh, the <coughs> Here's document number two that you will get in your package. Um, it's a letter actually written by then um, uh, Defense Minister Amir Hatami to the Supreme Leader Khamenei. It's a three-page document um, with, the, with the stamp and the details of it. Um, the it, um, basically is dated uh, October 24, 2022. Um, it, um, basically, uh, you know, one particular paragraph is right here. The, uh, this is the paragraph right before his signature. I mean, Hatami signature is right here. He uh, <clears throat> basically uh, reminds everyone that the 990,000 of the approved export of uh, 1.46 barrels uh, of oil per day actually belongs to the Pecto oil refinery, the uh, company 
so, and the entities that are affiliated with the armed forces and uh, what we call the Setade Ejraye Farman Imam, referring to execution of Khomeini's order, also known as uh, ECO or Setad. This is a huge controlled by the supreme leader. Uh, the, the assets are way over uh, perhaps uh, $200 billion. Um, one study back in 2003 confirmed close to $100 billion of their assets. Um, so um, this number, um, this is about two-thirds of the that was created for that year in uh, 2020. And of that, uh, <coughs> that um, uh, belong to the armed forces. They are the ones who sell it and get the money and the resources, and that's how, where the money goes. If anyone is wondering where does the money of the Iran regime sale of oil and petrochemicals and gas and everything, where do they go? A huge bulk of directly based on this information, this evidence, goes to the armed forces. And when we talk about armed forces, the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, is at the center of it. They dominate all of the armed forces, uh, a part of it, and they, uh, they have the, the, the big share of everything. Of course, in the armed forces, you have the state security forces that are directly, directly responsible for the Oppression of the protesters. You have the revolutionary guards, and you have the uh, uh, the army. So uh, that by itself, I think that evidence is very damning uh, to show uh, how much money and resources has gone, and that's a, a, a process that's been continuing um, ever since. Now, this um, document is document number three. We've uh, numbered it in the IRGC papers. Um, it's dated in January 13, 2021. It's a letter. You can see the, uh, the uh, logo and the letterhead of the, um, uh, the Parsian Oil and Gas Development uh, uh, Group, uh, which is, as I showed on the chart, one of the subsidiaries, major subsidiaries of the Qadir Investment um, uh, Group. Um, in this um, uh, document, this letter that goes from the um, Hossein um, Shahriyari, the managing director of Parsian, uh, goes to the uh, uh, Dr. Nimaziar Hussein. He's actually the CEO of the uh, Qadir Investment um, uh, Company. That's his name, the CEO. And this is the signature of Hussein Shahriyari. Uh, one of the things here, uh, he says that considering the specialty of selling crude oil, uh, PCCI was entrusted uh, with the sale of crude oil uh, for the general staff of the armed forces and uh, under letter number 1399 slash 3, that's a far date, that's in, you know, that's in 2000, um, uh, year 2000. This was officially communicated to um, PCCI. So in other words, it's saying that we are offic officially in charge of selling crude oil and bringing the funds um, uh, back to Iran and providing it to the resources. Uh, another aspect in that same letter <coughs> that shows that <coughs> he talks about the uh, um, uh, selling Venezuela's oil because Venezuela is another uh, uh, rogue country that uh, is sanctions uh, both in terms of their oil export uh, their national oil company is also designated. Actually, their oil company was designated on the same date, on the same day that the PCCI was designated uh, in 2011. Um, so it says a contract for the sale of Venezuelan crude oil uh, in the amount of 5 million barrels of extra heavy crude oil per month for one year. Uh, so that's like, you know, the list of some of the things that they have done. So that's another area where, you know, money um, and, of course, uh, political expediency is right there. And then talking about the Houthis in Yemen, uh, they are selling uh, to the Houthis uh, the things they, they actually uh, they need for their 
uh, terror operations for bomb making and all that. In that same letter, uh, it's talking about selling the chemi chemical product urea, which is also known as uh, uh, carbamide, um, exported by the Minister of Defense to the Yemen uh, and uh, referring to the Houthis um, in Yemen. That material um, is the key material if anyone is building um, explosives, bombs, and all of that. That's the key element. Um, so PCCI is right there involved in actually um, supporting and funding and, uh, you know, uh, procuring um, uh, necessary uh, means for terrorism. Uh, then um, you have among the uh, allies of the Iranian regime, that's Assad in Syria. Uh, in that same letter, there's reference to implementing the provisions of the Memorandum of Understanding between the Ministry of Defense uh, with the Ministry of Oil of Syria. Uh, that so the memorandum of understanding they signed, who is going to execute it, who is going to that's the PCI. Uh, that's where they have come from, come into the picture, uh, and you know, a lot more evidence, uh, you know, further elaborating on the role that the um, PCCI played in Syria. Um, now, in uh, transferring um, current, this is another, um, a document uh, that is dated January 13, 2021 letter by Ali Adibi, that's the signature and the name uh, right here. He's the director of legal affairs of the Qadir Investment Company, uh, written to uh, a Mr. Naiji, who is actually vice president uh, for corporate affairs of Qadir Investment uh, uh, Company. In that uh, letter, Adibi says, PCCI performs currency transfer. This is as specific as you can get in showing that this entity is involved in transferring currency for the Iran regime and for the uh, specifically the armed forces. It says as a foreign company, PCCI buys manufacture from Iranian and sells them to uh, foreign customers and then basically bringing the, um, the benefits, uh, the resources uh, back to um, Iran. Now, <clears throat> this is, um, there's another uh, document that actually attests to the, uh, to the same fact. Uh, this is um, uh, a letter signed again by the same person, Ali Adibi, uh, to this one. It's actually to uh, Dr. Husseini, the uh, CEO of Qatir, uh, Mazir Husseini, Qatir Investment Company. That's Maziar Husseini, and this is uh, Muhammad Baghir Qalibaf. Uh, he was actually, uh, before he was appointed to this position, he was actually the deputy for Muhammad Baghir Qalibaf, and Qalibaf, uh, veteran member of the Revolutionary Guards, a brigadier general. He was involved in suppression of the protesters back in um, uh, 1999, and afterwards, uh, during the student movement, and he was a state. Um, ally actually of uh, Supreme Leader uh, Khamenei, you know, he actually Qalibov's protege. Now in that letter, ADB says that this company, PCCI, can perform uh, currency transfer operations efficiently. Uh, that means, you know, with, with the least amount of and uh, with the uh, largest uh, percentage of success. Uh, they have done it, and this is the leading um, entity within the Iran to actually take combat sanctions and do the job for uh, the armed forces of the regime that no other entity um, has been able uh, to do. Um, now, uh, talking about the heavy oil, uh, 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 crude oil shipment, um, here's another that... Um, uh, talks about it's a it's an October 2022 uh, report that's pretty by PCCI managing director uh, director to uh, Dr. Husseini Mazir Husseini the CEO of the investment company it gives like one example here that a heavy crude oil shipment of 760,000 was loaded uh, from the ports of Iran. 
32 ships of Iranian um, light crude oil uh, were loaded with the amount of 1,070,000 barrels uh, from the northern ports of the Caspian Sea and a thousand million dollars, uh, I'm sorry, a hundred million dollars uh, from the mentioned uh, budget uh, was made available to the Ministry of uh, Defense. So they're actually giving a specific number here, the amount of the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the crude oil moved. And interestingly, this is the entity that operates both down south within, in the Persian Gulf and also in the Caspian Sea. They claim that they are the only, only that they operate in both uh, places, down south and the Caspian Sea. And um, now in that same report, it talks about um, also um, uh, that 605,000 tons of urea exported from Kermanshah, Pardis, and Shiraz petrochemical uh, companies. These three entities are all uh, subsidiaries of uh, Adir um, uh, Investment Company. As I mentioned, they have uh, about 29, uh, I believe, uh, uh, petrochemical refineries and, and, um, and entities and companies. So from those three, um, 605 urea were sold by this company between 2019 and 2022. And within three years, that's the amount um, that they have allocated to that. Um, now, again, talking about Syria, uh, going back to Syria, that's very important. This is another letter. Um, this one is written by Hossein Shahriari, who was the, uh, actually the uh, uh, managing of the um, Persian Gas Parsian uh, uh, um, uh, <coughs> Development Group um, that was addressed to uh, Hosseini. Um, and then he by actually accompany the Minister of Defense delegation going to Syria. It says people accompany the delegation of the Minister of Defense to Syria to supply uh, Syria with oil. And a joint committee was formed between Syria and Iran for the development of joint economic cooperation. And everyone knows the joint economic cooperation between the two dictators to doing one but about inside the country how um, the PCC here on their SATA have funding in addition to killing and and uh, the protesters actually providing the funds some of the funds that they obtained by circumventing sanctions to uh, to suppress the uh, the protests um, here are three documents and there are several others just these three um, that you can see the letterhead this one um, is a letter from SATA that's the emblem of the Minister of Defense uh, this one is the uh, Parsian oil and gas development group you can see the logo and the uh, the letterhead right here and that one is actually from the Minister of Defense um, going um, uh, and uh, now, the purpose of all the three letters that are somehow interrelated is about providing funds to those who actually suppressed a particular uh, act of demonstration in October 2022 in the height of these uprisings that started since September of 2022. Um, they are giving money for one particular demonstration on that day in um, in for the killings that they had done suppressing the protesters. Um, that the, basically the documents show that the uh, Parsian Gas and Oil uh, uh, Development Company uh, using uh, some of its subsidiaries, uh, one of them is this petrochemical company, uh, they funded uh, out in Iran who actually uh, revolted against them. Um, the Padre Pardis company, they hired 4 billion riyals to SATA. 4 billion riyals to SATA, uh, which as I said earlier, is the Armed Forces uh, Social Security Organization. 
to suppress the, that particular demonstration on October 18, 2022 in um, Asaliyeh Economic Region. And that's, uh, that was a major protest. We put out a number of, uh, at the time, a particular protest. We have video clips, uh, you know, we don't have the time to show it here, but we have the video clips of that protest, people, uh, the workers and the others who were there chanting death to Khamenei, uh, death to the dictator, and they were also um, uh, chanting um, uh, the, the uh, now is the year of um, sacrifice and Sayyid Ali referring to Khamenei overthrown. This is in line with all the major slogans of the protest uh, all over the country as people have been chanting, chanting death to Khamenei, death to the dictator, or uh, death to the oppressor, be the Shah or the supreme leader. Uh, so, um, now, <clears throat> let me um, uh, sum up what I said until now and then just um, also uh, spend a, a couple minutes about another issue that is actually very relevant. What we discussed so far uh, is all about deception, is all about lies, is, is all about um, how to circumvent, how to beguile the outside world about what the regime is doing. And uh, this, this is the nature of this regime. This is the DNA of the regime. Lies and deceptions have been part and parcel no matter what they're doing, no matter what area it is. Now, another area that the world uh, uh, might be a little bit more familiar with is the nuclear uh, weapons program of the Iranian regime, that the regime uh, has been um, lying to its teeth um, since the very beginning. If it weren't for the revelation of the National Council of Resistance of Iran back in August of 2002, revealing nuclear sites in Natanz and Iraq, uh, which actually triggered for the first time the IEA inspections of Iranian nuclear sites, God knows uh, where the regime would have been. Uh, a good portion of all of the sites that are now being inspected by the IAEA were actually built uh, by this movement. Um, and they have been, you know, everything they are uh, faced with the evidence that, that shows up. The regime is just like finding a way to, to explain it away, uh, to lie and just to cover up. And one very important example uh, is the um, underground nuclear facility uh, near Qum, known as uh, Fardo. Now, this is the site in Fardo. Um, why is this site significant? This site was actually being built underground when we first ex uh, exposed it in 2005 in a, in a press conference in Paris by NCRI. And um, uh, we um, said that they were building underground facilities here. No one really did anything until 2009 when more information came out about this. Then it became uh, public that under the mountains, very deep under the mountains, the regime was building uh, a uranium enrichment facility there. Now, as part of the nuclear deal in 2015, uh, what the regime um, did was they said, okay, we'll keep the centrifuges that are over a thousand of them, but we would never feed any uh, uranium hexafluoride. It will just be there, and um, it will be just for experimental purposes. Uh, only operating with vacuum, no uh, nuclear um, feed. That's not the case. And, and this, this is one of the major sites that the regime has been enriching uranium under the mountains, very high level, way beyond the, um, uh, the, the, the peaceful uh, level of 3.6, 20%, 60%, and all that. Now, this site, which is one of the uh, the centers of contention between the IAEA and the regime, the, the, uh, an information came out just uh, a few days ago uh, by a group um, uprising until the overthrow that showed that the regime, the uh, evidence was presented that the regime was actually um, expanding the site at the time. And, uh, adding uh, land and area to it. Uh, they have um, added 370 acres of land to both um, supposedly improve the security, but also have the ability to expand the site. Now, this is a site under the mountains that the regime has been lying to its teeth about, about and now they're expanding it. Uh, so what 
Does that tell you about the intentions of the uh, Iran regime? That's the letter that they put out uh, just a couple days ago. And, and the reason I bring it up here, even though it's not related to what I discussed earlier, but I think it's so important to know that everywhere you look at it, whether it's their oil and gas industry, whether it's their, um, you know, the sanctions issue, whether it's their nuclear program, whether it's inside the country, whether it's the disinformation, the, um, you know, they, they spread against their, you know, the uprising against their main opposition, they all are built on lies and deception. <clears throat> Basically, this uh, document shows that, um, as I said, um, they have added 370 um, acres of additional land right here. It the uh, right here. Um, it it mentions 149 hectare. Uh, but when you uh, convert hectare to acre, that's equivalent of uh, 370 acres of land that is officially um, allocated by the regime. Now. The, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, that's the place that we first uh, exposed, but why is the regime doing it? Um, there, are, there, there are two reasons they're doing it in Fardo. One, they want to rapidly expand uh, Fardo and accelerate the uranium enrichment um, operations, but also the other purpose is actually, you know, uh, uh, protracting and, you know, uh, the extending and expanding the negotiations, dragging it. Uh, with the IAEA misleading the agency um, and uh, so that this way the regime uh, will not, file will not be referred to the UN Security Council. This is a call that we've been repeatedly. Uh, so having said that, let me just conclude uh, what we discussed uh, today and what it really means. Um, I think the information clearly shows today that uh, the regime has been defying sanctions. Uh, violating international laws and funding its terror operations, its nuclear weapons uh, program, and suppressing its own pop population during the protest. And uh, <clears throat> the appeasement policy, how, how did all this happen? Somebody has to create a space for the regime to operate. That's where the role of Western nations come into picture, including the United States. Uh, here's the Appeasement policy allowed the Iran regime to be able to do all of these things, um, and uh, no focus has been on any of these activities by the Iran regime. Instead, uh, they've been talking about going back to the JCPOA. What does going back to the JCPOA mean? It means actually lifting. Um, so this, in the midst of talks of lifting sanctions, the regime finds room to maneuver, finds the space. And, and that's why it allowed uh, the regime to do all, all of those things, including most recently, uh, this is a, a, a convicted terrorist, Aslullah Asadi, who was involved in the uh, terror plot in 2018 to bomb a huge gathering of NCRI. And um, he was arrested, convicted, sentenced to 20 years. He spent five years of that and was just um, released by uh, the um, um, Actually, by the King of Belgium, uh, defying the the court rulings, which we had successfully fought and won. Uh, basically, at the end of the day, with the king and the ministers who jumped in and and, and got him released. Um, imagine if the the policies were different. If the policies were firm, these things could not have happened. Um, so, in other words, every dollar that is actually um, uh, given to the Iran regime under any pretext, it goes to funding terrorism. Don't ever buy this, uh, this notion that, oh, if the money, you know, lifting sanctions, providing money to Iran is going to improve the economy. This is not IRGC's, the ability of the, um, uh, the uh, armed forces. But particularly, you know, appeasement is always wrong, but it's really immoral, especially now, uh, since the uprising, when people of Iran in large numbers, huge numbers, are rejecting the regime, calling for change uh, in the country. Now, um, what should be done? I think the, the first step, the Congress uh, must really jump in. Uh, this is the role that they can uh, play. They can, you know, introduce uh, all kinds of new laws and regulations. 
to prevent the regime from um, evading the sanctions and uh, pursuing its nuclear defiance uh, in order to rush to the bomb. And of course, the administration uh, should do their job in implementing even the sanctions that are already in place as weak as they are, but they're, they're not clearly, they're not being implemented. Um, and uh, finally, uh, we believe given all the evidence that I just presented today and we'll be also on the nuclear side, and the nuclear defiance of the regime, this is the time for the U.S. and Western nations to um, reimpose all U.N. Security Council resolutions, the six of them, and um, uh, put the regime on its uh, back foot uh, this way. That's how you can meaningfully stand on the side of the uh, people of Iran. So with that, I want to conclude this part of uh, our presentation today, and I'd, I'd like to open the floor to um, to questions, and we're going to start with the uh, journalists uh, who are here. Please, uh, uh, if you have a question, raise your hand, introduce yourself. There is a microphone um, available that, um, that could be um, actually circulated. Um, any questions, please? Yes, please. Um, I want to be the Voice of America. Um, have you shared this information with OFAC? If so, what were the response? Uh, thank you so much. Yes, this information has been shared uh, with the Treasury Department, specifically with OFAC um, and also um, relevant government agencies. I'm not aware of their response, um, but, but certainly with this level of details, um, I think they have a lot of work um, to do. Appreciate that. Please, yes. Uh, I want to say that. I want to say that. Thank you. Yes. I, I, I was, uh, thank you so much. It's so interesting uh, and important. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about who it is that uh, you uh, assess to be ending up with the oil, who the ultimate buyers are. The documents uh, point to Syria, and you talked about that. There, there's one document that has many, many sales listed to central transfers to Turkey, and there's a little bit of mention of China. I bring this up because uh, there's an organization in New York called United Against uh, Nuclear Iran, and they, they've spent the last few years documenting Chinese uh, oil purchases, uh, Chinese purchases of Iranian oil to the extent uh, to which uh, the failure of the Biden administration's uh, push to redo the JCPOA, actually the administration it, it has in recent months been saying to increase pressure on China to stop buying Iranian oil. Can you uh, comment on these things? Who's ultimately buying the oil? Is Turkey actually buying it, or is that a reference to uh, transshipment? And, um, and then with regard to the administration's comments about cracking down Yes, no, no, thank you, thank you. Uh, this was a question from um, uh, Guy Taylor from the Washington Times, and uh, those of you who did not hear the question in the microphone, he, his question is basically, who are the buyers of the, uh, the oil that um, is being sold through uh, PCCI, who are the beneficiaries in terms of countries and, and the, the partners? Uh, well, these documents don't uh, get to those details because the purpose of these documents, these are mostly things um, that say come out. There are mentions, as you mentioned, mentions of China, for instance, uh, Venezuela actually there mentioned, and a number of countries. Uh, and um, uh, we don't have details, but I think um, for the U.S. government, for the Treasury Department, for those whose job is actually uh, to uh, uh, dig in and figure out where does all of these resources going, especially given the amount of information, traces that we provided, names of individuals and the companies and locations and all of that, all of them are very uh, significant uh, leads and, and, and clues for them to follow up, and I would appreciate if you would uh, follow up with the 
of relevant government agencies uh, because I think this is extremely important to get to the bottom of it, uh, to know exactly where it goes, but even more important than that, to stop it. Uh, this needs to be stopped because where it goes, the outcome is that the fund, we know where the fund goes, it goes to the uh, Revolutionary Guards, it goes to the forces, it goes to funding terror operations uh, in the region from Syria to, uh, you know, to Lebanon, to Iraq, to uh, Houthi, Yemen, uh, and you name it. Uh, that needs to be stopped. And I think the, the whole purpose of our press conference today is to, is, this is a wake-up call for the administration, for everybody, not just here in Washington, but every capital in Europe and other countries, uh, that this, this you know, huge amount of resources and money is being funneled illegally against all of the sanctions countries have implemented, uh, have, have um, uh, uh, imposed on, these, uh, on this regime, but they're, they're not working. Thank you. Um, any other questions we have? Do we have any questions? Yeah, please yeah, go ahead. Some questions from yes. uh, folks who are watching online. Can I have a mic, please? The first question is from John Bowden from The Independent. He's interested to know how U.S. can and should craft sanctions going forward that cannot be evaded. Also, is this merely an issue of insufficient enforcement, or is lack of uh, more robust sanctions uh, to prevent uh, Iranian regime and the IRGC from evading this? Thank you so much. So, um, to respond to the question of John Bowden from the. Um, <clears throat> well, it's a combination of all of those things because. Uh, there are sanctions imposed in some of the, uh, those individuals I named, uh, or entities that are named here, but these are mostly secondary sanctions. Um, uh, so you need to really tighten the sanctions to begin with. Uh, you need, you know, much longer layers. Uh, a lot of these entities fall under the FTO designation because they are engaged in funding and resources for terrorist operations, they need to be um, designated um, as, you know, sanctioned under the FTO. That's, that's one step. Second, in terms of implementation, uh, you know, what, what has been done since 2011 that PCCI uh, was designated, even though it was under the ISA, I have never seen anything um, that um, relates to implementing anything related to the PCCI, at least I couldn't find it uh, on the internet, nothing, and certainly nothing meaningful because those operations not only didn't stop, but expanded. Um, they're boasting about this, uh, you know, that we're just like uh, operating with, um, you know, impunity, uh, conducting all of their operations. So in, in that sense, um, that's extremely important uh, to do to strengthen, but also to implement it. But, uh, but you won't be able to implement it if your policy is going in a different direction. If the policy is a policy of appeasement, I think it's moot to talk about implementing uh, sanctions. The whole policy of appeasement, the whole purpose is to lift the sanctions, uh, is to give to operate for the, for the regime. Uh, so even though the question is a technical one, but in reality, it's a very political question. It boils down to the policy of the United States. It boils down to the policy of these uh, European nations. Uh, where are you heading? What are you, are you trying to do? Are you signing the people of Iran and, and, and tiny news on the professors? Or you are providing room and space uh, for the IRGC repressive forces uh, to operate freely, to have own people, but also fund terrorism. Uh, that's why I think it's extremely important to, to, to pass two and a half years that the policy of appeasement has proven to be counterproductive. It hasn't altered the behavior of the Iran regime. To the contrary, it has further encouraged the regime to, part, to continue the same path. And you know a lot of the evidence we 
provided, they were all within that framework of the past, uh, most of them in the past two and a half years. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Any other questions? Yes, one more question. It's from Todd Wood of CD Media. Uh, Todd is asking, what do you expect the administration do with respect to all the activities by the IRGC and the regime? Hundreds of sanctions are already in place. What more can the admin do uh, to prevent this? Well, I, uh, thank you uh, for the question by Todd. Um, you know, I, I think in a way I, I answered that question, but uh, I think that gives me the chance to re-emphasize on something that I mentioned. Yes, there are sanctions already in uh, A, they are inadequate, B, they're not being implemented. Um, and, and the reason behind all of both A and B is the policy. Uh, the, the policy of appeasement, the policy of accommodation, uh, the policy of continuously trying to reach out to the regime, uh, the policy of like, you know, um, the negotiating with the Iran re 